Welcome, and thank you for joining the Geospatial webinar. Joining us today are Sean Lilly from CCM, Tom Belena from Esri, Leonard Daly from Daily Realism, and Michael Beal from Autodesk. First, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this webinar and we'll share the link along the slides and the recording shortly. At the end of the session, please complete the short survey form to help us better design future events. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Michael Beal from Autodesk. Michael? Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm Michael Beal from Autodesk, and this is the agenda for today. We'll first start with Sean Lilly from CCM, who's going to talk about scaling GLTF with 3D tiles, followed by Tim Bellini from Esri to talk about I3S and GLTF in geospatial. Next, I'll talk about point clouds with GLTF. And then finally, Leonard Daly will talk about the geospatial profile and we'll wrap up with a Q&A. Before we get started, here's a quick introduction as to why GLTF can be used for geospatial and AEC. But first we, we've, first we need to understand a couple of examples of where GLTF needs to be tweaked. So let's start with a first example. If you have a large detailed model, such as this large, you know, large hospital here on the right, and you convert it to GLTF using the standard GLTF tools we have today, and you optimize that GLTF with compression and texture mapping, um, you'll still generate a really large single GLTF file. And this is gonna break most of our tools. And it's also gonna crash your browsers and game engines. It's just simply too big. And two gigabyte GLTF file, that's a bit of a catastrophe. So now what? Well, that's kind of where the GLTF geospatial group has formed. We took some of these potential problems with GLTF and we've looked at ways to try to solve them using some of the industry best practices. So one example, is to take this large CAD model and convert it to some kind of hierarchical level of detail, some kind of tile streaming system. So an HLOD, a hierarchical level of detail, is a way of taking something like the CAD model or perhaps this large point cloud scan and break it up into uh, sizable chunks and tiles at different levels of detail. Now, when you take that GLTF uh, tile set and, uh, and the tile um, HLOD, you can, your browser can now stream those tiles based on a camera distance. The video on the right here shows tiles streaming in as little cubes, these white bounding boxes. And as the camera gets closer, there's more bounding boxes or more tiles loaded into the browser. And that shows more detail. And then as you zoom away, those tiles are unloaded to save browser memory. So that's just one example. Another example is location. If somebody gives you a GLTF file, how do you know where it's located on the planet? So for GIS and AEC problem sets, this is important. So let's say I have a CAD model, I've converted it. How do I specify that, G, that, that GLTF file is located here in downtown Boston? How do we make this a standard? Maybe using an extension like say GeoPose. And then the last example is metadata. And what do I mean by metadata? Well, take this chair, for example. This chair is made up of parts and assembly, and each part has a special ID. Now that ID row could represent something inside a database or a spreadsheet. So when I view that GLTF or that, that chair, when I click on one of its parts inside my GLTF, it's somehow connected to metadata in my database. But how do I connect these two things? How do I connect the geometry to this metadata? And how do I do it in a standard way? To talk more about these topics in more detail, I'd like to welcome the next speaker, Sean Lilly from CCM. Welcome, welcome, Sean. Thanks, Michael. So I'm gonna be talking about how we scale GLTF with 3D tiles. 3D tiles being one of these hierarchical level of detail formats that Michael brought up. So first, uh, just like a quick background about Cesium. So at Cesium, we're building an open platform for 3D geospatial. 
And we started with Season Jess, which is an open source JavaScript library for 3D Globes. Uh, started in 2011, and we were an early adopter of WebGL. And um, we, saw, we sort of saw this need to have sort of an open standard for initially just individual models. And that's part of how GLTF formed. And Season Jess has one of the first GLTF loaders. And then as, as we saw like the exponential growth of geospatial data, we realized that GLTF alone was not enough and we needed a new format. And that's, that led to essentially the creation of 3D tiles. And um, even more recently, we've just noticed that in addition to the growth of the data, there's a lot more semantically rich data. So there's a lot of like metadata or attributes that, that are attached to these 3D models. And that led to the development of 3D tiles 1.1. So to summarize, sort of the different types of geo, 3D geospatial data that we see. Uh, one type that, that Michael brought up is, is point clouds, like large billion or greater point data sets. We also have 3D buildings, sort of these uh, stylized buildings, say from like OpenStreetMap. And then we have sort of scanned meshes, photogrammetry, uh, that's being collected at a, a really great rate at, at the moment. And then there's vector data to represent roads, building footprints, and other things. Uh, there's the AC BIM CAD data, voxel data, and then instance models for things like trees. So what are some, some of the common themes for all these geospatial data sets? Uh, the, most, the most obvious one first is just the massive scale. Like these are often planetary in scale, and it's not practical to fit them into a single GLTF. So really we require some sort of spatial subdivision and we need some sort of tiling scheme, such as like a quad tree or an oak tree or a grid or other data structures that might make sense for the certain data. And this is where hierarchical level of detail comes in, or the ability to have simplified versions that can be loaded sooner and only load sort of detailed areas where you need them. In addition to the massive scale problem, we also have uh, the, we, the need to represent metadata. So to have, to be able to like identify individual features within a data set, whether that's individual buildings or trees or other components of the model. And these features may have metadata. So they might have properties like building heights or building longitude latitude and also semantics that say what these properties actually mean. Uh, additionally, coordinate systems, we, we, have, we have to place the data on the globe somewhere, whether that's handled through sort of an extension uh, or as just a transform in either the 3D tiles or GLTF. And then precision is also a very important thing. Since we're dealing with Earth-scale models, um, often we're in the range of 6 million meters, and we need various techniques to avoid jitter and all the sorts of problems that happen with 32-bit floating point on the GPU. And then performance. Uh, since we're streaming so much data, it, need, it needs to be super high performance. Uh, we need to maintain a constant frame rate, even as the camera's moving and loading new tiles. And then compression, both geometry and texture uh, are very important as well. So 3D tiles uh, attempts to solve some of these problems, at least like the massive scale problem and some of the metadata problems. Uh, 3D tiles is an open standard for massive 3D geospatial data sets. It's built on GLTF. And it's a way to express hierarchical level of detail. So you have leaves at the highest resolution, and then each parent of the tree is like a simplified version of its children. And this allows you to only stream what you need for a given view. And even to like to break it down further between like the difference between 3D tiles and GLTF, 3D tiles is essentially a JSON format specifying the bounding volume hierarchy, the geometric error, and the refinement type. And then this creates a tree of tiles and each tile points to a GLTF. And then within each GLTF, we have the actual geometry. So this little picture on the bottom is, is really just one tile within the larger data set. Uh, it has geometry textures, it has the compression, the feature identification and the metadata. Uh, and I just want to quickly go through a couple of demos just to show what this looks like. So here's a, a scanned mesh of uh, the San Francisco Ferry Building. And this is also highlighting some new features in 3D tiles 1.1, where uh, in addition to just seeing the mesh itself, we also have access to the, on a per texel basis, we can see sort of what component that, that pixel represents. So this one is, is the windows, this is the wall, and then you can see the clock up here. And then I can sort of visualize this with colors. And I can also use that information to control styling. So if we wanna make the windows transparent, we can use the, the metadata that's embedded in the GLTF. And then uh, the second, second uh, one I want to show is similar, uh, but this is like a whole planetary scale example. And it's using a tiling scheme called S2. 
Uh, and he uses a new concept in 3D tiles 1.1 called implicit tiling to have a more sort of efficient bowing volume representation. Uh, but here we have uh, essentially six root tiles all subdivided into a quad tree and it, it covers uh, basically the whole globe. And we also have sort of classification information here. So uh, here we have land cover classification and it shows sort of that this is, all these different areas have different types of sort of, uh, yeah, different land masses and, and such are represented here. And then we could do more cool stuff with this. We could write like a custom shader and season dress and visualize that. Uh, so since we're talking about GLTF, uh, I did want to point out some of the common like GLTF extensions that we use a lot. Uh, so for, for point clouds, uh, often, actually, well, Michael's going to go into more detail about this, but not many people actually use GLTF for point clouds, but it's actually a really good format for point clouds uh, with just a few changes, like just change the primitive type to zero instead of the default, which is four for triangles. Uh, that gives you point rendering. And then you could use vertex colors to represent the point col colors. And then there's the extension KHR materials on lit, which is often good for point clouds because point clouds typically don't have normals and usually do want to render them on lit. Uh, for compression, there's there's a few different options here. So we've seen good results with MeshOpt and MeshOpt is built on the mesh quantization extension. And uh, Draco theoretically also does support point clouds. Like there's nothing in the bitstream that, that prevents that. I, just the GLTF extension itself is currently restricted to triangles, but could be extended in the future for point clouds as well. And then on the metadata side, like the ability to encode extra information besides the visual properties, uh, there's a few, there's a couple extensions that that CSIM has proposed for that. Then on the photogrammetry side, similar, uh, materials and light is a great extension. Typically, sort of the shadows are already baked in because it's it's from real photographs that the mesh is derived. So you don't necessarily always need like an additional shadow pass or lighting pass. And then for compression, also similar, Draco's great, uh, MeshOpt is great, but then also uh, KTX and Basis are, are very good and significantly reduce both well, roughly the same in terms of like network transfer as JPEG, but it's significantly smaller on the GPU in terms of the amount of memory used. And then same same with metadata, the ability to represent feature IDs and to have to have metadata. And then instance models, uh, same deal. The main difference being that we can take advantage of the mesh GPU instancing extension. So the mesh only has to be provided once, and then there's separate accessors that supply the translation, rotation, and scale of instances. And just to go into a little bit more detail about some of the metadata extensions that the CSIM has proposed. So first is ext mesh features. And really the sort of the goal behind this is that draw calls are expensive and we wanna minimize how many we make. So if we have say a hundred buildings, like very simple building shapes and a tile, we don't wanna have a hundred different draw calls. We want to be able to sort of batch them into a single draw call, but still differentiate the different buildings by a feature ID vertex attribute. And then this vertex attribute can be used to look up other rendering details, uh, either metadata or, or colors or other things like that. And it's, it's essentially paired with this other extension called EXT structural metadata. This is where the actual values are stored. So there's a few different encodings. So property tables, just like a columnar type format, property textures for very fine-grained uh, metadata at a per textile basis, and then property attributes, which is, can be useful for point clouds. And along with just these encodings, there's also a whole schema concept of having classes, properties, and enums uh, similar to other formats like, like USD. So that's, so that's sort of the, the quick overview of 3D tiles. But if you're interested in learning more, uh, definitely check out the specification. We, we uh, just got published for 3D tiles 1.1 as an OGC community standard. And along with that, we also released a new 3D tiles validator so it's sort of a ground up rewrite uh, of the existing validator and it handles both 3D tiles 1.0 and 1.1. We also have a sample data repo that has a bunch of good examples. Mainly if you're sort of building your own 3D tiles render, it's a great place to start to see very simple examples. There's also a reference card that similar to the GLTF reference card that, that highlights sort of the major concepts of 3D tiles. And there's a ecosystem and resources page that links all the different tools, all the different viewers, all the different generators of 3D tiles. And then finally, I just want to mention Season Native as well, which 
it has a lot of 3D tiles related code in it. It's, it goes beyond just 3D tiles, but uh, if you're building a C++ project and you want to work with 3D tiles, either serializing 3D tiles, deserializing, or like actually selecting like the selection library for which tiles to request at a given frame, CCM is a really good choice for that, and it's open source. And that's that's it for me. So next, I'm going to hand it off to Tim to talk about I3S. Hey, Tim. You're on mute, Tim. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Today, uh, I'll talk to you about I3S uh, and GLTF in geospatial context. Um, so as uh, Sean was uh, mentioning, and also Michael, uh, there are different ways to stream massive amount of geospatial content uh, to the web and desktop application. I3S is one of those formats. Index 3D scene layer is an OGC community standard that allows you to stream massive amount of geospatial data, uh, both for uh, web, desktop, and runtime applications. Um, I3S supports uh, five different layer types, uh, 3D objects, uh, point scene layer, integrated mesh, point cloud scene layer, and then uh, lastly, that was adapted uh, by OGC at the end of last year, is building scene layer. So uh, this, uh, you know, the different layer types have uh, served obviously different purposes. Uh, if you look at the integrated mesh, uh, which we call a uh, skin of the earth type of layer that marries both texture and geometry into a single uh, 3D asset and is uh, efficient to stream over over the cloud, over the web to lightweight and uh, heavy clients as well. Uh, as well as point cloud and uh, 3D object uh, scene layers are also used uh, for representing different 3D assets. Um, as I mentioned, uh, OGC has adopted this four layer type. So since uh, I3S is actually, was actually the first uh, 3D streaming standard adopted by OGC uh, and has gone through many evolution over the years since 2017. Uh, the current version that was adopted by OGC again at the end of last year is OGC I3S 1.3, and that brings supports for buildings in there, which we'll see examples of that. So let me talk a little bit about some of the enhancement and improvements that have gone through the various uh, versions of uh, the I3S uh, standard uh, since it's been released. Um, OGC I3S 1.2 brought about uh, a significant improvement for material support. Uh, the material support in I3S is now GLT feature compatible, as well as uh, new capability to to uh, page or uh, collect uh, uh, visualization nodes into uh, a paged resource and access them in a more efficient manner. Uh, geometry compactness, uh, in, in addition to uh, quantization to the geometry, we now have support for Draco compression uh, for both uh, 3D object and integrated mesh uh, type of layers. Uh, another one that has been dear and near to our heart has been uh, the addition of uh, uh, KTX2 or uh, in in Kronos KTX2 container basis uh, image compression format that dramatically uh, brought down the uh, transmission size of uh, 3D assets over the wire, uh, as well as also bringing down the uh, client side memory requirement. We'll see some examples of that. And then obviously uh, there's also more optimal selection strategy, um, standardized on bounding, oriented bounding volumes uh, for uh, selection criteria. Um, Speaking about the uh, enhancement, uh, node paging, really what it brought about was uh, previously uh, client applications uh, used to request uh, one page at a time, uh, and hence uh, it resulted in a very chatty uh, pattern between the client and server, but by paging it together, we can uh, significantly reduce the client-server chatter, if you will. By default, this page uh, 64 nodes into one page. Uh, Draco, as I mentioned, uh, significantly uh, reduced the uh, the geometry size uh, being streamed over the wire, as you can see in some of this uh, uh, example data set, uh, geometry uh, that was being streamed over the wire uh, compared to I3S 1.1 has uh, significantly reduced up to 85-90%. Um, if we can just look at an example of what that looks like, uh, if you uh, the, uh, the the video on the right, the right two columns are I3S 1.1 that uh, didn't employ node paging 
or uh, or uh, draco compression and you can see that you know the uh, one on the right with ogc i3 s 1.2 was uh, draco and geometry uh, paging uh, renders much faster and uh, for the sake of time if we complete it if we allow it to complete um, something that would take 25 seconds is still rendering uh, in the OGC 1.1 version without Draco and node paging, and, you know, showing that really brought about a significant improvement in, in, in um, uh, client experience. Uh, if I drag it out here, you'll notice that actually it would take almost 60 seconds, uh, comparable one in the iTrace 1.1, and also here versus uh, to about 75 seconds. So three times uh, improvement on client side uh, fetching out content. Um, moving on to the other optimization um, support for uh, compressed textures in the form of KTX2 or basis uh, compression has again significantly reduced the amount of uh, size that is being uh, uh, you know, transferred across the wire. Why basis? Why in KTX2? Because of you know client fragmentation of uh, different uh, compressed texture supports on different platform uh, basis. Uh, we've chosen basis as uh, as the default go to format uh, because of its ab availability on all these different plat platforms that you see. Um, we've done some work uh, with uh, Binomial, a company that was. Uh, able to uh, share basis in an open format uh, standard uh, to actually expedite the actual creation of the content. Now, the client side uh, the decompression uh, is very efficient and is very fast, but there hasn't been a lot of work done to actually bring about the uh, encoding ratio. So uh, working with uh, Binomial, we're able to reduce uh, the encoding speeds of uh, uh, basis uh, universal uh, universal uh, uh, universal texture format by uh, almost nine times when using uh, GPU. Uh, this is uh, using OpenCL uh, to do the compression, and this really significantly reduced it. Of course, when you have a whole lar a large amount of textures, as you can see here, uh, ten times more than uh, the original uh, layer that is being cooked in here. Uh, the efficiency reduces, but still significantly reducing the amount of time that it takes to uh, generate a basis uh, encoding pair. Um, now, oops, sorry, went back. Um, the uh, other uh, improvement that I would like to talk about is in real terms what this means. Uh, this means in real terms really uh, reducing the amount of size, uh, the amount of uh, texture asset and 3D asset that is being uh, streamed across the wire significantly. Here you can see in one test case for Munich that we have, uh, it reduced uh, you know the compressed texture size by uh, more than uh, or by almost fifty percent uh, from twenty six to uh, eleven uh, gigabytes. And uh, further continuing this work, as I mentioned, uh, using GPU, we were then able to reduce the amount of time that it would take to compress it. Uh, from you know many hours to uh, you know 40, 40 minutes. Again, this is for a real world uh, size data set for uh, uh, for Munich uh, integrated mesh layer type. Um, continuing on the uh, I3S support, um, I3S is available in various uh, uh, free and open source uh, softwares, including uh, Loaders GL. Uh, Loaders GL uh, was uh, one of the first format that uh, or application that uh, support right 3s uh, it support both i3s 1 1.6 and 1.7 format uh, 3d object integrated mesh and then recently uh, Loaders GL also added support for building scene layer so you would be able to visualize a building scene layer uh, using Loaders GL as your client application as well um, we have also worked with the community to uh, put uh, debugging and uh, visualization uh, application uh, based on the loader GL to uh, visualize a bounding volume or vertex normals uh, that would allow you know content providers and data providers to uh, check and validate their uh, i3s content. Um, Another another issue that or another ask that we've seen in the community is the ability to convert between different uh, layer uh, different data formats. Um, so uh, one work that we did with the community was to be able to convert 3D tiles to I3S and I3S to 3D tiles. This actually enabled a lot of people to be able to consume 
different type of data sets in the application, the target application that they have. Um, the uh, last uh, work that we've done just recently was uh, CZM uh, is ability to actually visualize I3S natively in CZM.js. Again, uh, this uh, allowed people to natively consume an I3S layer directly in CZM.js uh, while, uh, while, while, you know, they're, while not having to convert their content from an I3S format to 3D tiles directly. And we believe that this also, you know, enhances the uh, enhances the uh, ability to uh, cross cross the enhances uh, people's ability to consume different types of data sets. Um, the last layer type that I would like to mention is the uh, OGC I three S one point three that uh, brought support to building sin layer. Uh, building scene layer is uh, a type of a layer that allows you to visualize uh, large amounts of uh, uh, building uh, building information model type of data. So the example that you see here in the video is a BIM layer for uh, for a library in New Zealand, and being able to visualize this and you know peel it through the different floors and also isolate uh, different types of uh, different type of assets within the layer itself and being able to query. Uh, the uh, actual uh, information associated with it is very powerful. Um, I have uh, one quick demo that I would like to show a live demonstration that actually shows the uh, the uh, performance uh, gain uh, performance gain was uh, uh, was uh, using compressed texture. So uh, as you can see here, uh, maybe I can move the slider right up, up on top. As you can see here, uh, the client application uh, that is using JPEG is using much, much more memory, uh, 1,264 megabytes versus 635. This is because, again, using um, using um, basis compressed texture format as opposed to JPEG would significantly reduce the client side memory usage. And uh, this would allow the uh, client application to basically render at the highest resolution of the data that is being, uh, you know, visualized. As you can see, because the restriction for the client to have uh, the restriction, the memory restriction of the client would be much, much more reduced. Uh, again, you know, uh, at 1.2 gigabytes versus 465, and visualizing it at 100% quality is is a huge uh, difference uh, maker. Uh, by just by using the KTX2 uh, or basis compression. Um, um, just going back to my slide, uh, one uh, last use case that I would like to um, showcase is um, geospatial usage or uh, I3S usage in game engines. This is uh, a new phenomenon that has been occurring uh, where people wanted to use uh, geospatial data and game engines being able to benefit uh, from the uh, rich uh, user experience and effects uh, available on uh, game, uh, gaming systems. So uh, the uh, ArcGIS, uh, ArcGIS Maps SDK allows you to support uh, visualizing I3S layers and game engines, both Unity and Unreal game engines are, are supported, uh, meaning that you would be able to visualize uh, you know, your data that you are used to visualize in desktop and, and, um, and mobile uh, systems. Uh, directly into the game engines, being able to benefit from the uh, higher realism found in uh, game engines. With that, uh, I yield back, uh, maybe back to uh, Sean. All right. Thank you, Tam. That looks very cool. I'm just going to share my screen. I hate to take it away from these cool visuals there. <laughs> <laughs> Please go ahead. Alrighty. Let's go here. Thanks, Tam. Uh, so I'll be talking, my, my name is Michael Beal with Autodesk, um, and I'll be talking all about Point Clouds, AEC, and GLTF. Uh, in particular, I'm going to cover some use cases in the AEC industry that's, that's relevant for or important to GLTF. And then um, I'll show you what we've been up to at Autodesk around generating 3D tiles and points and viewing them in our cloud platforms. And then finally, I'll dive into some experiments with 3D Tiles Next and GLTF, and some new extensions for metadata that can be applied to AEC BIM. So let's start with some quick use cases that are relevant to AEC and GLTF and scan geometry. 
personal scanned imagery. Uh, so the first one in the consumer market is you know, for real estate. And it's not really not hard to miss that 3D walkthrough if you've ever used Zillow. And that's thanks to cameras, uh, sorry, Matterport's camera system and viewing platform. The Matterport camera captures 360 panoramas and stitches them together into this 3D model. Now that 3D model could be GLTF, for example. The end result is a 3D walkthrough that's fast, it looks great, and it can be accessed from anywhere. And this innovation has made it easy for us to view house interiors. It's something that we kind of take for granted these days. Now imagine if you could take that same tech, that same idea, and apply it to the AEC industry during a construction project. So in other words, taking 360 panoramas, a three, 3D walkthrough, just like Matterport, but on the construction site. And you create that 3D walkthrough every day for say 12 months for the life of the project. It would allow you to compare yesterday's 3D walkthrough with last month's 3D walkthrough and see the progress in that particular room or building site. And that helps you compare that with a CAD model or the CAD blueprints, which you can see in the bottom left. And that's essentially what Open Space AI does. They help make job site um, they make the job site visible from anywhere and at any point in time. Now, similarly, if we add point clouds to that similar concept, we take drone photos, convert them into a point cloud, and then align them with a CAD model. We can colorize the CAD model based on a schedule from, say, Microsoft Project. Green, good. Red, you know, uh, delayed, and that's bad. So Reconstruct Inc. is a company that creates these exterior visualizations and makes it accessible from anywhere, right in the browser or from an iPhone or desktop. And then last example, um, similar to the previous ones, except the previous ones were more on the low precision. This one's more on high precision. Instead of using a photogra uh, photogrammetry from a camera, we'd use a LiDAR scanner. The LiDAR scammer, scanner contains a lot more accurate or higher precision measurements. And that, that's be really useful for when comparing deltas um, of an example here, uh, an old water treatment plant against the original CAD model to find costly defects. And that's also, a, that's also accessible from a browser. So what do all these have in common? Well, if you haven't figured it out, <laughs> there are, these large scans are made accessible from anywhere. But you can't exactly jam a 40 gigabyte LAS file or GLTF and expect it to just work into a, a browser. It, it somehow needs to be streamed. And one way of streaming it is with a hierarchical level of detail system and tiles. And I'm going to use the 3D tiles as an example. So 3D tiles, it's essentially a parent manifest file, a tileset.json. It looks something like this. And inside there are bounding regions um, that defines the hierarchical level of detail. Each bound points to a chunk, a tile, which contains points or triangles. And that can be rendered by something like GLTF. And so you end up with hundreds of these uh, PNTS files or GLTF files. And so how does that stream? How does that, how does that actually work? So you would take a 3D engine like say 3JS and it would load in these tiles based on calculating the distance from the, from the tile center and to the camera. And it compares it to a geometric error. And that comparison, it's gonna load in denser points closer to the camera and sparse points further away. Now Autodesk now generates these 3D tiles in a Forge cloud with our RCP converter. Let me explain a little bit of that. We essentially take say a million points, that water treatment plant. We divide the scan into a hierarchical level of detail regions, in this case, an octree structure called chunking. And then we subsample each tile in that hierarchy um, with about 100 points in each tile. And then we compress those points with Draco compression and rename the file as .pnts. So this is the standard 3DS, uh, sorry, standard 3D tiles. And I'll talk about the GLTF version shortly. The engine that does this conversion to 3D tiles is Autodesk's standard Recap Pro, which is a core engine found in AutoCAD, Revit, InfraWorks, Civil 3D. It helps bring multiple scans together and aligns them with CAD models. Um, the overall process for an end user is typically they would upload the RCP file through a browser or desktop, convert it in the cloud. Um, that 
would then store the 3D tiles uh, in, in the cloud. And then the browser would then stream that standard format 3D tile set JSON and GLTF files or PNTS files into the browser using that hierarchical level of detail structure I mentioned. And this is done through an open format. And that's the key here. We're looking for an open format that can be used not just by a proprietary viewer like uh, Autodesk Forge viewer, but we'd also want to be able to be able to consume that in other viewers as well. So I'm going to show three examples. I'm going to show CCM, I'll show the Forge viewer, and a toy example with Mapbox, just as a simple example. This is uh, CCM, and this is streaming in a point cloud set. It's loaded the outermost tile, which is that white bounding box. And that's the, the uh, highest level of detail of these points. As the camera gets closer, it loads in more of those bounding boxes, which is representing a tile. This is just a debug view. And so with more tiles, you get more detail. Then as you zoom away from this building or this, this HLOD, um, those boxes disappear. And that means we're throwing points away out of the browser memory. And so we're not, we're not overloading the browser as we stream things. Another quick example, um, this is Forge Viewer. Uh, this is uh, the CAD model uh, hosted on um, BIM 360. And then this prototype showing um, that same CAD model combined with the 3D tiles point cloud set. In this case, this is a GLTF version of the points. So you can see that it's uh, streaming in the points and then I can perform the same operations I, I'm used to doing with this Forge Viewer, uh, such as um, measuring, um, applying a measurement tool. The last example is just a toy example um, and brings together Mapbox um, satellite imagery combined with a CAD model that was converted to GLTF and then combined with the point clouds, the same point cloud set you saw in that last example. And it's just showing how you can bring all of these things together. This one's showing the bounding boxes. So I've mentioned 3D tiles, but what is 3D tiles next? Well, that was kind of the... Uh, prototype name for the next version of 3D tiles. And this is where we're going to use GLTF for the tile. Uh, so we take that previous example before of the tile set JSON. You can see the JSON on the left. Instead of pointing to a PNTS file, we're going to point to a GLTF file instead. And that's going to be our, our tile. Now, the, the advantage of this is we're reusing GLTF viewers that can already render GLTF. And so we use GLTF that has point primitives. Um, it's GLTF's an open format, and there are lots of GLTF viewers and tooling out there to, um, to help render this. Um, in this example, we experimented with different compression. Um, I used mesh op compression. It got a really good decoder performance of about a gigabit per second. And then the last part, as, as Sean demonstrated, using some extensions in GLTF, we can add picking and segmentation support to the point clouds. Um, the point cloud GLTF itself, each tile um, is, has an extension for using the unlit material, as Sean mentioned. Um, we tested a couple of different compression op options, which I'm going to show you some results for. And I'm going to also mention the extension mesh features in a, in a short while when I talk about CAD. Um, and as part of the geospatial profile, we put together a sort of a, a condensed list of things that would help um, as a baseline for, uh, of, of rendering point clouds. Of, if you're generating point clouds in large data sets and you're going to generate tiles, um, then agreeing on a set of GLTF extensions will um, hopefully improve compatibility. Mesh op compression results. Um, for point clouds, these, these were comparable. Draco um, and MeshOp had similar compression ratios. The, the main difference was the uh, decompression performance of MeshOp was, was quite good at one gigabit per second compared to um, about a third of that with Draco. Now that last example I showed with Mapbox showed how to combine multiple tile sets together. And this is where alignment comes into play. If I have uh, my CAD model and I can align it with an extension such as GeoPose, and I do the same thing for a point cloud set, um, I, can, I can convert my points and I convert my CAD models and have multiple tile sets layered together into a single scene. That was, that was what the Mapbox example was about.
Now, switching gears, I'm going to talk a little bit about AEC metadata and how it's related to GLTF. So at Autodesk, we often get asked, can I convert a CAD or BIM model to OBJ or GLTF? And the answer is, is, is definitely yes. Um, but the question really is, do you need that extra detail? And do you need the geometry connected to the metadata? But what do I mean, first of all, by detail and metadata? So let me explain with an example of this CAD house on the left. Each piece of geometry in this house has metadata associated with it. So like this wall that's highlighted in blue, it has an ID on line number seven, and it points to, uh, sorry, points to line item number seven in the spreadsheet on the right. Now from the spreadsheet, I can find its name, the manufacturer, how much money it costs for the material, and all sorts of other metadata like that. And that's all because I've associated that unique ID to a piece of geometry. Now CAD models are usually detailed and with the right amount of detail, you can select and highlight individual pieces. And when you, and you can associate these tiny pieces to metadata. And when you can identify individual parts inside a GLTF, uh, then we can set things like part visibility. And that's really useful for analyzing things like quantity takeoff. So show me all the steel in the building, or maybe show me all the concrete in the, bu in, in the building if I'm doing some sort of, say, sustainability analysis. Um, another thing is I may want to change the color of the geometry. Um, and so that could, that could be useful if I have IoT sensors with temperature readings, and I want to colorize the individual pieces of geometry based on where the sensor is. So one tool that could help convert CAD models to GLTF is something that um, my team uh, worked on called Forge Convert Utils. It's an open source project to, that decodes our proprietary format into GLTF. And when we save the GLTF, we put the part ID into the GLTF node name. And that way you can keep that connection between the geometry and the CAD metadata found in our BIM databases. But with CAD, with CAD models, there is a high level of detail and representing every part as a node will end up resulting in many, many draw calls. And so we need to somehow perhaps batch these draw calls. Now, one option to do that is doing a mesh merge. And there's a CLI, CLI command line tool called GLTF pack that you can try and experiment with to do that. And when you do a mesh merge, you're essentially taking that ID and you're putting it into the GLTF in a custom vertices attribute. And you can see from, um, from some of the work that Sean was talking about, there is an extension called uh, mesh features, which, which explains this technique. And then when you render that object, uh, when you render that GLTF into your canvas, you'll have a, uh, you can use GPU picking to retrieve that custom ID, custom attribute. So here's a quick experiment of this in action. Uh, we've taken a CAD model, we converted it to GLB, and it contained about 90,000 individual parts. Uh, those parts were things like walls, doors, nuts and bolts, and that all requires in the order of hundreds of draw calls. We then optimized that GLB with a mesh merge and packed the part ID into the custom vertices attribute using the extension mesh features. We then loaded that G GLB file into Unity using GLTF fast decoder and with a small modification, and then ran the standard Unity raycast. And that was able to detect the mesh face and then find the part ID. And then we display that here in the console. You can see the number in this case is number 2213, which matches what was in the browser on the left. So in summary, we covered some use cases uh, in the AEC industry where scan data is accessible from a browser, thanks to hierarchical level of detail systems like 3D tiles and I3S. And you've seen what Autodesk has been up to around outputting 3D tiles with point clouds and then uh, experiments using GLTF and point clouds as well. And then lastly, we explored GLTF in relation to BIM metadata and how a new extension mesh features could potentially help. And that is a wrap from me. So next to talk about the geospatial profile is Leonard Daly from Daily Realism. Leonard, over to you. 
Thank you, Michael. So going into the geospatial profile, as you've seen, the geospatial problem is quite large. We have to deal tremendous amounts of data and there is significant uh, data handling issues that have to go with that. And not everybody can handle it. And you don't even know when you first open a GLTF file, if they're gonna work. So in the process of defining things and making them standardized between people, we had to look at uh, what can be included and what should a viewer support. So over that, we came up with a geospatial profile. And the geospatial profile is not a specification, but it does define features and capabilities necessary to support a standard range of geospatial needs. It's based on, it's only, we're only using ratified extensions, that's Kronos ratified. Uh, there are other extensions that may be very useful for the particular problem, but because we're not sure of the, the all the controls or licensing necessary, we just we restrict it to ratified extensions. Uh, in the process, we're also developing a roadmap for future profiles and sub-profiles so you can anticipate what's coming next. And most importantly, this does not change the contents of GLTF. These are just side specific side statements about what should be there. Uh, there is nothing required and it doesn't modify the GLTF files. So the features in the baseline profile are listed here. Those in bold are existing ratified extensions. The two that are in uh, italics, uh, EXT mesh app compression and EXT mesh GPU instancing are in the process of being ratified. There's been a considerable amount of discussion today on the mesh app compression. The mesh GPU instancing allows the same object to be in the scene multiple times with only having to have one instance in the GPU. So that's particularly useful for things like trees, uh, other vegetation, or sort of standard buildings that are need, needed to be populating a scene uh, whose particular appearance or function is not necessary for the overall effect of what's trying to be done at that time. Future work is ex 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 wider range of metadata. Notice the profiles did not include any of the very fancy metadata pieces that Michael just discussed, um, and also developing a generalized HLOD system. The current profiles under discussion do not include HLOD because the GLTF as intrinsically as GLTF is not does not support that concept. Uh, we're looking at an item that was released last summer called GLXF for experience format. Um, which does uh, natively include GLTF and, um, and supports tiling as discussed. It is compatible with uh, 3D tiles. So there'd be no significant change in that respect, at least from a conceptual standpoint. And the timeline to get the future work done is approximately nine months. So please, now we're going on to the Q&A section. Please, uh, Enter your questions into the system as we bring all the panelists back on to. There we go. So the first question, and I think this is probably to Tam and Sean, how can GLB parsing time and processing improve for real-time runtime use cases running on limited hardware? Yeah, I took a at least a first pass at this answer, uh, but I mean, essentially GLTF is designed for almost direct upload to the GPU. So like the data structures kind of mimic graphics APIs. So it's it's meant to be limited processing but you are still bound by JSON deserialization speed. So if you're using a browser, you're kind of sort of stuck with what's there. But if you're using something native, there might be faster libraries that you can check out. Um, and then there's also tools to optimize GLTFs. So if your GLTFs are just, have too many nodes or meshes or primitives, 
or other sort of unnecessary stuff, then a tool like GLTF pack is good for optimizing them. Okay, thank you. And this one may have been partially answered uh, during the presentation, but also can you, Sean, can you further define a chunk of a tile which T structure is used? Yeah, so um, 3D tiles is what defines the tree structure. And um, really a tile is a chunk of the overall larger model that the 3D tiles represents. So it's not really, there's not really a chunk of a tile. It's more like a tile is a chunk of the tile set, I guess is maybe the best way to put it. And then there's a variety of tree structures. So quad trees and octrees are very common ones that we use. Okay, uh, Tam, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just going to add to Sean's answer to the first question that appropriate batching of your uh, 3D resources also applies here. Uh, I would say batching, batching, batching is always uh, uh, is always the answer for you know for the first question. Um, we have seen that you know uh, a lot of people generate assets or 3D content uh, targeting different devices or different use cases, but uh, when you are trying to use them in a uh, uh, real-time use case, the appropriate batching of your data or input, uh, input data really makes a big difference. Okay, thank you. For 3D tiles, and this may also apply to I3S, how are cracks between the tiles from different LODs handled? So when you have a tile at one LOD abutting against the tile at a different LOD, how do you handle the, the mismatch between details and and other cracks that may show up. Yeah, so one way we do this, a uh, pretty standard way is to encode the tile edges and then draw what we call skirts, which are just like vertical cliffs along the tile edges that don't, they don't point straight down, but they point like almost to a slight angle downwards. And with those, it does help. It's less likely that you'll see cracks between the different tiles. Um, but I think there's also a bunch of like screen space approaches that I personally haven't worked with, but um, you could do some sort of like screen space blur if you can identify like where the cracks are. Yeah. Yeah, I think the skirts are a good solution. Only time that they would become an issue is transparency. If you said transparency to your mesh layer, uh, then you'd see the impact of that. But uh, typically for base map layers, that works fine. Um, so skirts are also the ones that we typically use uh, or in integrated mesh type of layers, skirts are routinely used actually to cover for the cracks. Okay, for instance, messages, meshes, using GeoPose is a good idea, but which type is the best? Yaw pitch roll, quaternion, or others? And in case of those large instances, would it make sense to create another of the GeoPose systems? And Michael, uh, do you want to address that one? Uh, sure, I'm actually going to bounce it a little bit to Tam there. Um, so we've we've discussed GeoPose in our um, um, you know, special interest group, um, choosing which way to, to go of those two options, um, it's really uh, undecided. Um, both both have their place. You, there's there's times when you want to uh, maintain the existing lat long system. Other times you, you want to use a transform that's based on quaternions. Um, using using whatever was native. If if the original transform came from say quaternion system then it makes sense to keep the precision from that quaternion. Um, and that way you're not avoiding conversion and loss. So um, we haven't come up with a, a solid answer on that um, other than that we're exploring GeoPose and you know, we're interested in, in hearing use cases. If you've got some use cases where um, you, you've got a, a certain, some thoughts and ideas, um, we would be very much interested in hearing those use cases. Tam, did you want to add something to that? Sure, yeah. So yeah, GeoPose, we have discussed it in this uh, work group and also at OGC. Um, I3S and I assume also 3D tiles have a frame of reference already. Um, so when you bring in content uh, from a particular spatial reference and you want to render it displayed into the application, that frame of reference uh, becomes relevant. GeoPose is actually a standardized way of uh, representing that. and especially when when you use uh, geospatial content say in game engine which also have completely different frame of reference when you try to marry that uh, with uh, geospatial uh, needs 
that's where actually the power of geopost comes um as i said like uh since uh the layer type itself i3s and others as well have this frame of reference uh geopost would be a redundant information but we've been also exploring it and nothing has been really decided to see if it could be done uh, sort of like you know uniformly that could be applicable in different uh, uh different uh spaces sean yeah i guess on the gltf specific side uh, one thing about instance meshes I might worry about is currently for GeoPost, the sort of the either the heading or the yacht patrol or the quaternion would be stored in JSON. But if we had a lot of instances, it might make sense to store those values in an accessor similar to the mesh GPU mesh instancing extension. So I could see a combination of GeoPost and EXT mesh GPU instancing. I'd like to remind the attendees that answers uh, questions can be continued to be asked, use the QA feature. We will attempt to get all questions answered, and those that we are not able to will be answered afterwards in, in a document. So what is the recommended way to handle large geospatial coordinates in GLTF to prevent jitter issues as mentioned in the CCM presentation? Should I use the node matrix of scale and or transition, translation for this, or assume that the client viewer handles this properly? Yeah, so the, the main technique we use for this is called relative to center rendering. So the vertex data is stored close to zero. And then you do have a GLTF node transform that brings it from its local space into a global space. And that's stored in JSON. So you can get like the full precision there. And then as long as the client, when it actually computes the model view matrix that it sends to the GPU, as long as that math happens in 64 bit, then you kind of like cancel out the large factor of the trans translation with the large factor of the view matrix, like those two kind of, when you do the math in 64 bit, it minimizes the precision loss when you do that transform. Uh, and then that, that's essentially the key. And then I linked uh, an article that kind of described this technique in more detail. Tam, do you have anything similar with I3S? Yeah, storing uh, the uh, relative uh, uh, location. So for every vertex, uh, we don't store the actual vertex position, but uh, offset from the center of the bounding volume. Uh, that would also help you minimize uh, any amount of distortion that would come apart, that would come up by uh, representing uh, large uh, values into the vertices. But yeah, what Sean described is similar, uh, similar uh, what we do in I3S as well. Um, Okay. Adding to that, from the Mapbox toy example, um, interestingly enough, Mapbox uses a, a UI, a, a UX trick. So uh, during a pan operation, it will recenter the scene back to origin. And so uh, it looks like, uh, you know, you've got these massive scales of, of a scene, but in reality, everything keeps getting recentered back to origin. And that avoids the jitter precision issue you see with the GPU. But again, you know, you do need... You need to calculate the very large, uh, you need to calculate that offset in 64 bit precision initially before you can start performing, um, you know, determining how much of an offset you need to adjust by. Yes, and then just to add to yours, that's exactly, we store the uh, center of the bounding volume and, uh, 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 and as a double. So, uh, you know, that precision is always kept, only the vertices are kind of offset from that uh, bounding volume center that would be stored and that really minimizes the uh, that really minimizes any 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 distortion that or jitter that might come up. And what are the current polygon limits for 3D tiles for gigantic geospatial 3D meshes? Several hundred million million polygons for the original data set? Yes. Yeah, ultimately um, I don't know what like the true upper limit is, but it's it's quite high because uh, really it, the data set is ultimately broken down into tiles that are more manageable pieces. So um, you're kind of almost limited by disk space in a sense if if the engine is is doing things correctly and if the tile set is well structured. Michael or Tam, have anything to add? Yeah, I would say it's really about batching again, right? The minimum renderable uh, piece tile, if it is uh, batched appropriately, then really, 
uh, the limitation is the amount of space that you can store, right? Disk size. Um, but it really needed it needs to be properly sorted in, uh, and uh, batched so that you know you're not rendering very large amounts of data at the same time where bottlenecks might might come up. So as long as it's tiled, batched properly, I think there isn't any. With the i3s also, it's the same. Uh, because at any given time, what you're rendering on the screen, what you're visualizing is really a limited amount. And uh, as long as it fits into available budget, you know, memory or yeah, CPU cycles or GPU, then it should be good enough. Yeah, I think adding to, the, adding, adding to that conversation, inside uh, one of the things that, you know, taking, um, taking the limitations of GLTF and then shifting it um, into a, a format like 3D tiles with tiles or I3S with a tile set, um, it takes away the limitations of what GLTF um, as a single file um, has. So there is a limit on GLTF. Um, it's, it's a, it isn't a well-defined limit, but it breaks in certain ways. One example is node count. That's what we discovered. So if you have a, a very heavy detailed CAD model, for example, and you convert that to a single GLTF file, you could have a million nodes and those million nodes won't load in anything. They won't load in Blender, they won't load in Unity, and they certainly won't load in your browser. And that's just the nodes. That's not even the triangles yet. Um, and then you get down to the triangle count and there's obviously GPU limits on the buffer sizes. Um, but in generally speaking, we've looked at these examples to say, what can we do to GLTF to alleviate that? And that's where these tiling techniques uh, come into play. And once you go to a, a spatial index, like you know, a, a hierarchical level of detail, it shifts the problem to a, essentially an n log n problem. You run out of disk space before you run out of, um, you know, hitting a limitation on the number of triangles to render. Okay, thank you very much. That concludes our Q and A portion. I wish to thank Sean Lilly from Cesium. Pam Blaina from Esri, Leonard Daly, myself from Daily Realism, and Michael Beale, our MC from Autodesk. Thank you, gentlemen, for a wonderful session. We appreciate all your time and effort in making sure this is successful. Um, for our audience, we have some upcoming sessions that may be of interest to your, may be of interest. The next GLTF meet, meetup is on January 24th. Then the next WebGL meetup will feature Google's work on Google Earth, and that's happening on January 31st. And finally, we have a GLTF meetup scheduled on April 4th. If you're interested in presenting at the April GLTF meetup, drop us a note at events at chronosgroup.org. And Michael, I'm sorry, could you go over the Geo Week slide? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so we have um, a talk at Geo Week coming up on February 14th in Denver. So if you are interested in what we're talking about here, um, we have a talk uh, with Sean and with Tam um, and the topics on using 3D tiles, GLTF, um, and I3S with point clouds in the AEC industry. Um, come join us. It's in person. Um, and then after the talk, there is a general meetup. So come to the networking lounge and we'll have some free t-shirts and all sorts of fun swag as well. And then I'm going to hand it back to you, Jeff. Thanks. Um, as a reminder, a recording of this presentation along with the slides will be available on the Kronos Group website and a direct link will be sent to you in a follow-up email. As you leave the webinar, please take a moment to fill out the survey that pops up. Your feedback is important to us and help us improve these presentations. Please let us know if there are any other Kronos-related topics you may be interested in and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. Have a great day.